It started with a sound in the early morning hours of October 4, 2009. The mother detected a presence in the bedroom where she and her 11-year-old daughter, Jamie, lay sleeping. Jamie, is that you? Kim Cates called into the night, reaching for the bedside lamp. Yeah, Mom. The light never came on. Two men, one on either side of the bed, unleashed a storm of blows from a knife and a machete onto the still half-asleep pair. On the mother's side, an adrenaline-fueled intruder hacked away, swinging his machete like a baseball bat, furious and brutal, while on the other side, the first assailant's partner stabbed the young girl. The screams of alarm and pain turned to pleas. You don't have to do this. Please stop. Toward the end, as their assailants neared the end of their hacking dark slaughter, after the pleas had met no compassion, the mother began to console her daughter, even as she struggled falteringly to defend them from the rain of blows. Everything is going to be okay, she muttered amidst the attack. It wasn't, though. A few final wild swings of the blade, and then the mother's head was pulled sharply back and her throat slit. Her daughter was lifted and thrown across the room, shattering a glass door before lying still, apparently dead. One more blow of the machete on the daughter's inert body, the blade mixing her blood with her mother's, and the assault was over. According to the medical examiner assigned to the case, in the final minutes of her life, Kimberly Cates sustained at least 32 injuries. Her skull was split open, her left eye socket destroyed, several organs were pierced, and some of her bones hacked into pieces. She lived through them all, finally dying from massive blood loss. Jamie, Kimberly's 11-year-old daughter, sustained massive injuries as well. She was struck at least 18 times, leaving no part of her body untouched. The blows severed part of her left foot. Her skull was split open and the force of one of the blows shattered her jaw. But by playing dead, she survived. After her assailants left the house, she struggled to the kitchen, blood-soaked and terrified, and managed to summon the police to the scene of the most brutal, seemingly random and senseless crime in the history of Mont Vernon, New Hampshire. A little more than 2,000 people called the sleepy suburban community of Mont Vernon home. The town, nestled in the south-central part of the state, was an archetypal, trusting American community. Many people had known each other, and even strangers were united by a mellow trust. Doors were rarely locked, and for years crime only appeared on the evening news, reported from the larger towns of New England. As with most American suburban communities, the feeling of trust ran throughout the thicket of overlapping communities, Amherst, Bedford, Milford, Wilton, near Mont Vernon. The revelation of such random, unprovoked brutality staggered all of south-central New Hampshire. When the identities of the victims were released, the astonishment, outrage, and fear became amplified. Kimberly Cates was a well-loved 42-year-old nurse employed by several New England hospitals. A native of Ohio, she and her family had moved to Mont Vernon in 2004, in part because of the safety and community the area offered. Her daughter, Jamie Cates, was a bright, curious sixth grader at Mont Vernon Village School. Jamie holds a black belt in karate. According to reports, Jamie tried to defend her mother during the attack before being so seriously injured that she played dead. Friends and family say that mother and daughter were extremely close. They spent a large part of their free time together and attended many of the same classes as a mother-daughter team. David Cates, by all reports a devoted husband and loving father, was away on business on the night of the attack, a random detail that it seems the assailants did not know. The Cates lived on Tro Road, a dirt road that runs through a wooded, isolated section of Hillsborough County. Trow Road's isolation proved alluring to the home intruders. In the weeks before they assaulted Kim and Jamie Cates, the assailants had selected Trow Road as the site of their home invasion. At first, it seemed as if the attackers had chosen well and that they had made few mistakes. According to the first story by the New Hampshire Union leader, reported in the hours after the attack, investigators were left with little evidence. There was a tire track left in the dirt of Trow Road and, according to Jamie, they were looking for a white man. Investigators hoped that these small slivers of evidence could be the foundation upon which they could start to build an investigation. Investigators would not be in the dark for long. The killers would all but deliver themselves to authorities. We're about to do the most evil thing this town has ever seen, Stephen Spader, then 17, allegedly said, as he and three young friends drove to Tro Road. 
His passengers were Quinn Glover, then 17, William Marks, then 18, and Christopher A. Gribble, then 20. Together this group of motley misfits made up the Disciples of Destruction, a criminal brotherhood founded by Spader in September 2009, the month before the murder. The random killing was to be the final, irrevocable initiation to the gang, a way to seal their commitment with innocent blood. Random killings have become a fascination in certain dark corners of American culture, particularly music culture. From death metal to more aggressive strands of hip-hop, some young Americans have been conditioned to see achievement in randomly creating victims. The only requirement necessary for victimization is weakness or less-than-perfect vigilance. The Disciples of Destruction were such deadly enthusiasts, the Cates family their unwitting prey. Like many suburban kids with too much time on their hands, the Disciples of Destruction were drawn together by a shared fascination with the cultures of death and mayhem. They not only admired the Manson family and the Zodiac Killer, but they were self-proclaimed juggalos, followers of the rap group Insane Clown Posse, known for their celebration of violence and mayhem. The pre-dawn hours of October 4th were calm. David Cates, Kimberly's husband and Jamie's father, was away on business, leaving the two women home alone at the end of Dark Trow Road. If either Jamie or Kim had been awake just before dawn, watching TV or reading, they would have known something was wrong when their ranch house went dark. The house's power lines were cut in preparation for the slaughter. According to testimony, Stephen Spader and Christopher Gribble intended to make chloroform in order to render their victims unconscious. What their actions would have been if they'd succeeded are unknown, but given the callous disregard for life, it seems safe to assume that they would have sunk to even more depravity. Quinn Glover seemed to think so. As Glover testified at Stephen Spader's trial, Spader wanted to break into houses, steal stuff, kill people, stay the night, and make scenes for the press with their bodies. He talked about eating people, roasting people, putting heads on stakes, making scenes for the press. Although the group's handiwork wouldn't be as cinematic as Spader had wished, they nonetheless made their bloody mark. Since they were forced to locate the sleeping family in a strange house without power, Spader used the faint glow from Jamie's iPod to help them navigate through the Kate's darkened home. It was over quickly, in a manner of minutes. As Glover testified at Spader's trial, Spader asked me about the Zodiac Killer. I told him what I learned, that his victims were so random that he didn't stay long enough at the scene of the crime to leave evidence. Glover continued with an assertion, seemingly borne out by the swiftness of the crime, that Spader's plan for the swift, random attack was inspired in part by the Zodiac Killer. According to court records, neither Glover nor Marx participated in the actual killing. According to their separate testimony, Glover retreated into the Kate's living room when the assault commenced. Marx likewise did not participate, but allegedly stood at the bedroom door and watched the attack. In addition to killing Kim Kate's and brutally attacking Jamie, the Disciples of Destruction made off with a small amount of property, one of David Kate's old wallets, a pearl necklace, and two wooden jewelry boxes. Approximately seven hours after the killing, Gribble allegedly pawned much of this property. The group's grand financial earnings? a few cents more than $130. The hours after the murder must have been quite hectic for killers as dim-witted as the Disciples of Destruction. The end came quickly. None of the killers could keep silent about their crimes, apparently as devoted to their own destruction as much as they had been to that of their innocent victims. According to authorities, by 5.30 a.m. Gribble and Spader had rendezvoused with their friend and accomplice, Autumn Savoy. Spader's failed attempts to recruit Savoy for the actual murders did not keep the youth from assisting with the murder's cover-up. Gribble, Spader, and Savoy allegedly dumped bloody clothes, shoes, as well as some of the stolen belongings into the Nashua River. After the disorganized, incomplete disposal of evidence, the group called it a day and went home to sleep. After their beauty rest, Gribble and Spader met at a mutual friend's house, Kyle Fenton, around 5.30 p.m. to discuss the murder a mistake that helped bring the group to justice. According to a police timeline, on the morning of October 5th, Fenton's mother visited the Amherst, New Hampshire police. The woman had overheard her son's conversation with Spader and Gribble, and she began to fear that her son was somehow implicated in the vicious killings that were being discussed in the news and on the television. 
This bragging, not 24 hours after the last machete blow, was a hallmark of the killer's impulsive, immature personalities. Over the next year, residents of New Hampshire would learn that this impulsive braggadocio lay at the root of the savagely violent attack on the Cates family, terrorized for no other reason than that four teenagers thought they could get away with it. They did it for kicks. They did it for thrills. They killed because there were people that could be killed. This wouldn't be the last time that the group, Spader in particular, discussed their handiwork. As Senior Assistant Attorney General Jeff Strelzen said at Spader's trial, Spader admitted his work. He enjoyed it. He liked running it through his head afterward. Stephen Spader, superficially at least, seemed to be an unlikely ringleader. The longtime Boy Scout had dropped out of Brookline High School, but in the months leading up to his arrest, Spader had earned a GED. Sure, he was aloof and a bit of a loner, but few people realized the depth of his depravity. The same kid who wrote on the inside of a hoodie, this is Steve's sweatshirt, Steve who is awesome, was, according to Glover's testimony, also the same person who enjoyed his work, the same person that bragged and joked about waking a woman up with a machete to the skull. Spader's incarceration did nothing to shut his mouth. While awaiting trial, Spader had the audacity to pen an open letter, labeling the citizens of New Hampshire uninformed idiots and taking David Cates, husband and father of Spader's victims, to task for openly opposing the inclusion of William Marks and Quinn Glover in their high school yearbook. According to Spader's handwritten letter, it is not Billy and Quinn's fault that they were arrested and charged with what they were charged with, and yet through all the struggle they both are still trying to get an education. At the same time that Spader wrote this letter to the New Hampshire public, he was also writing to Chad Landry, a fellow inmate at the Hillsborough County Jail's maximum security section. According to the Telegraph of Nashua, the letters describe the preparation, attack, and the hours and days following the murder in excruciating detail. A handwriting expert testified that Spader wrote the letters. During Spader's trial, defense attorney Jonathan Cohen did all that he could to fabricate reasonable doubt. Spader's defense ultimately relied on a kind of liar-liar argument. Spader, according to Cohen, wrote those letters and bragged about the crime because he wanted the attention, not because he did the crimes. The jury in the case didn't buy Cohen's argument. In October 2010, a little more than a year after his crime and on his 19th birthday, Stephen Spader was found guilty. Guilty on two counts of first-degree murder, guilty of attempted murder, guilty of conspiracy to murder, guilty of conspiracy to burglary, guilty of witness tampering. Spader was sentenced to life without parole and an additional 76 years for the attempted murder of Jamie Cates. According to the Telegraph, Judge Gillian Abramson made each of the sentences consecutive to one another to ensure that you stay in that cage for the rest of your pointless life. Christopher Gribble served as Spader's second-in-command. While Spader slaughtered Kim Cates from one side of the bed with his machete, Gribble is accused of standing at the other side of the bed repeatedly slashing Jamie Cates with a knife. Gribble, like Spader, was also a former Boy Scout, and before he became entangled with Spader's murderous obsession, Gribble had considered joining the Marines. Gribble's military ambitions were surely born out of considerations other than honor and country, though. Photographs of Gribble posing with his favorite knife abound on the Internet. In many of these Gribble sports, a braggart's grin as he looks into his computer camera while wearing oversized headphones. Although Gribble's trial was not scheduled to begin until February 2011, in early December 2010, Gribble surprised the court by pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, but admitting to the crimes. If the jury decides that Gribble was indeed sane at the time of the attacks, he will likely be sentenced to life without parole. If, however, the jury found that his sanity was compromised, Judge Abramson would have been forced to hold a hearing on whether or not Gribble is a danger to society. According to the Associated Press, if the judge ruled that he was a danger to society, which seemed consistent with the facts of the case, Gribble would be sentenced to a secure psychiatric ward of the New Hampshire State Prison. He would then be entitled to have a review of his threat to society every five years. Insanity was a heavy lift for Gribble's lawyers to prove. In his statement to police, Gribble said he wanted to kill someone for a long time and was disappointed he didn't feel any emotion following the Cates killing. 
He told the police that he and the others planned on burglarizing the home and killing anyone who might be there, just for fun. Though this does seem to indicate a psychopathic disregard for human life, Gribble's methodical actions seem to speak otherwise. When the home invaders approached the house, they attempted to gain entry through two different paths. First, they shattered a downstairs window. Second, they removed the plastic side support of an air conditioner so that Spader could make his way through the house and open the door for his co-assailants. Gribble both smashed the basement glass and removed the piece of the air conditioner that allowed Spader to enter the house. Glover's attorney managed a plea deal. In exchange for the possibility of Glover seeing daylight unfiltered by prison bars, Glover pleaded guilty to burglary, robbery, and conspiracy to commit burglary. He received a sentence of 20 to 40 years. Glover's squeamishness in the face of the inhumanity displayed by Spader and Gribble may have changed his life. William Marx's future was in the balance. Following Glover's lead, Marx worked out a plea arrangement. In exchange for a 30 to 60 year sentence, Marx agreed to plead guilty to conspiracy to commit murder, accomplice to first degree murder, and conspiracy to commit burglary. According to the Telegraph, Judge Gillian Abramson rejected the plea deal, saying it did not satisfy the goals of sentencing, which include deterrence, rehabilitation, and segregation from the community. Marx subsequently withdrew his guilty plea, though he honored his agreement to cooperate in the prosecution of Stephen Spader and Christopher Gribble. He eventually got a 30-year sentence for his cooperation. Savoy admitted his guilt in 2011, confessing to conspiracy and hindering apprehension. Consequently, he received a sentence of 5 to 12 years in state prison for his involvement in a heinous, seemingly arbitrary crime that deeply scarred a tranquil small town. He was granted parole after five years and lived with his mother for a while, working 60 to 70 hours a week at two restaurants at the Mall of New Hampshire in Manchester. There's no such thing as an innocent stranger anymore, Diane Richardson, a former substitute teacher, told the New Hampshire Union leader in the aftermath of the crime. That certainly seems to be the case. In a state that prides itself on its independence and freedom, the crimes of the Disciples of Destruction are forcing a reevaluation. On a personal level, the people of Mount Vernon now habitually lock their doors. Many residents have obtained guard dogs, and it seems that few can be interviewed about the trial without mentioning the handgun or axe that they now keep bedside in the event of an intruder. Something about the random, arbitrary nature of the crimes committed by Spader, Gribble, Marx, and Glover have left people thinking that callous murder and random attacks are the new normal. The crimes have even left an impact on the state's legal system. Although New Hampshire holds a reputation as the most conservative state in New England, it has not executed a person since 1939. The state only hosted one prisoner on death row at that time, a cop killer. None of this group, including Spader, would have been eligible for execution. Their ages at the time of the crime prohibited the death penalty. Beyond that, according to the Boston Globe in New Hampshire, under state law, the death penalty can be imposed in the murder of a law enforcement or judicial officer, murders for hire, murder while serving a life sentence, and murders committed during kidnappings, rapes, or drug sales. Not to worry, though, because New Hampshire abolished the death penalty altogether in May 2019. David and Jamie Cates are alive. They stay out of the public eye and try to help each other heal.